Okay, so today, uh, this is our second to last day of Aristotle, and now we're actually getting into some things that are directly tied to practical reasoning. Um, and we're getting into some really murky topics. This, this book in particular, you notice Aristotle says several times, all right, we'll make a fresh start here, we'll make a fresh start here. Then again, thinking about it this way, then again, thinking about it that way, and it may seem somewhat confusing. There is some stuff in here that continues to attract scholars' attention in part because um, even the scholars aren't sure what Aristotle is saying. So if you found yourself, as some of you have expressed to me, I am not quite getting what's going on with Aristotle at, at different points. Um, if you have any reason for that, this is the, the book, this is the chapter where, where that's the case. So there's some things in here where I'm just going to lecture and, and sort of lay out what I think is, is happening, other parts where we're going to do discussion. This is the question that I would like you to uh, think about that I'm going to call upon you for examples of, uh, just you know, to have some, some class discussion. What is something, and, and don't pick anything that uh, copying to would actually get you in any sort of trouble, um, if you've done anything like that recently, but what is something that you've done recently knowing that it was wrong? Um, if you haven't done anything recently knowing that it was wrong, pick something that you did not so recently knowing that it was wrong. Because I'm guessing everybody has done some stuff. I don't have to go back far. I can just think about the weekend, actually. Um, so, I mean, nothing particularly juicy or, or spectacular. But, you know, I am not, myself, um, virtuous in every respect the way I would, I would like to be. And I'm guessing that... Most of you are in that situation as well. Um, if you've fallen into that case, then you are what Aristotle calls incontinent. And so here, here we need to get something out of the way right away. Because the terminology in, in this chapter often uh, confuses people. And when we talk about um, somebody in our society being continent or incontinent, we usually think about it just with one sort of thing, and, it, and it's mainly scatological. You know? um, Aristotle, was, the people that were translating Aristotle were using the terms in a somewhat different sense. What they're calling continents and incontinents in Greek is uh, kratia and akasia. And those mean things sort of like uh, strength of will and weakness of will. Um, or self-control and lack of self-control. So the continent person is somebody who has self-control or the capacity to use their, their will to, do, to make themselves do what they know is right. The incontinent person is somebody who they know what the right thing is to do, but they, something slips, something doesn't happen right, and they find themselves doing the wrong thing. This is a common experience throughout all of human history. You know, you can um, look at any culture and you will find some people who are self-controlled in this sense and some people who are not self-controlled. Uh, there's one other term that, that thankfully they, they, use, they translate as brutality in this translation because the other translations that people will often do of it is bestiality. Um, and again, we, we associate that with deviant sexual practices, which would actually fit into that, that category for Aristotle. But brutality means, or, or bestiality in Aristotle's sense, means um, being like an animal, being just like an animal. Because we are animals, right? We, we eat, we drink, we um, have all sorts of drives. We move from place to place. We, we, you know, we share most of our DNA in common with most other living things, even worms. We have about 40% of our DNA in common with them. Uh, when you get to chimps, it's about 98%. So we're pretty much animal, but we're not just animals. Aristotle, remember we talked about this before, it talks about a higher rational part. Plato talked about this as well. And then a lower appetitive part. So when you have brutality, there isn't a higher part. The higher part is sort of disengaged. And some of the questions that you guys had earlier in the semester about, um, what about, say, addiction? 
that would fit into the category of what Aristotle is calling brutality. Can we really hold an addict responsible for the behavior that they engage in? Maybe not because <coughs> they're not actually just you know, incontinent or vicious. They may actually be totally unable to, to control themselves. So, um, we all have experience with, with these things. Hopefully not too much with this. People who are genuinely brutal are extremely dangerous and you should stay away from them. Um, because you can't count on them. You can't reason with them. You can't count on them not to follow their, their appetites, whatever they, they happen to be. And if you happen to get in the way, you're in trouble. Aristotle also does talk about one other thing. He talks about superhuman virtue. And he doesn't mean like, you know, Batman or Spider-Man. If they actually display virtue in those movies, it's, it's more like what we talk about is, you know, the virtues in Aristotle. Or they're sometimes <coughs> confident they're incontinent. Batman's never incontinent, but, but Spider-Man often is. Um, when he talks about superhuman virtue, he is talking about what we might think about in our time as people that were called saints. Um, they're able to accomplish something, or moral example. They're able to accomplish something that's on a scale going beyond the merely human. And he's not going to talk about that much in the rest of the chapter, is he? So we're not going to talk about it much in the class. I just want to point out that that sort of thing does exist. But it, you know, it's sort of of its own nature. It's sort of like if in brutality there is no better part to the person, and so the worst parts predominate, in superhuman virtue, there is no longer any worse part. There's nothing for them to control. They will automatically do the right thing. Um, that's very far from our world of experiences. We're, we're more likely in, in here, or we're virtuous, or we're, we're vicious. So, bless you. A lot of uh, stuff going around like this. Let's, uh, let's look at what he, what he actually says. Um, he says, let's make a fresh beginning, point out the moral states. There's these different types. Um, and we can put these on a sort of continuum where if you think about virtue and vice, they're very separate from each other, right? The virtuous person does the right thing, and they actually take pleasure in doing the right thing. They have the right habits. The vicious person, it's the opposite. They do the wrong things. If it's you know, vicious with respect to uh, wealth, it could be that they dispense it far too easily um, to the wrong people for the wrong reasons, and it's a habit too. And the virtuous person thinks what they're doing is right, and the vicious person actually does think what they're doing is right. They just have a mistaken view on things. So these are pretty far apart from each other. Continence and incontinence are just a hair's breadth away from each other. What's the difference there? The, the continent and the incontinent person, they both know what the right thing to do is. They're not like the vicious person. The continent person chooses to follow their conscience or to follow reason or to follow the, what Aristotle calls right moral principle, the thing that's telling them, hey, this is the right thing to do. The incontinent person, in one way or another, allows something else to, to make the decision for them, and they wind up um, doing the wrong thing. So, again, all of you are pretty familiar with this, right? You've all been on both sides of this divide. Um, how do you get from one side to the other? Well, you know, if you, if you deliberately try to make yourself do the right thing, pretty soon it becomes easier to become continent. And then if you do it often enough, you will become virtuous, right? How do, how do we get virtues? You guys remember? What, what makes virtues? To do the, the uh, same virtue over and over again as a habit, and then eventually you become virtuous in it. Yeah, so you do things like a virtuous person. You, you behave justly towards, so you're, first you behave justly towards your siblings. Then you behave justly towards your fellow classmates. Then you behave justly towards 
uh, people you don't know on, on the train. Then you behave justly when you're in the workplace, and eventually you become a, a just person. If you are incontinent and you know what the right thing to do is, but you keep on doing the wrong thing, at some point you're likely to slip into vice. That, that sense of, oh, I shouldn't have done that. That was the wrong thing to do. Will eventually vanish, Aristotle says. You, by, you know, we become what we do. That's another way of thinking about it. Another sort of famous uh, slogan that goes along with this is fake it till you make it. And, have you guys heard that before? Um, maybe you will when you get into other contexts. It, you know, if you are continent, you aren't yet virtuous. So let's take justice again. Justice includes, you know, treating people fairly. Maybe you don't want to treat people fairly. You ever been in a situation like that? You just dislike somebody. You'd like to cut them out. You don't want to invite them to the, the, the club meeting or give them, the, you know, the portion of something that you're supposed to or they're part of your group and you're supposed to do a group grading exercise and, you know, you're tempted to, you just don't like them, let's grade them lower. Um, but you choose not to. You choose to do the right thing. That's continence. You're, you're not yet virtuous, but you keep doing that and eventually you will become virtuous. So, remember back in um, last Monday we talked about uh, our choices and how that goes into virtue? Our choices are taking place for the most part at this level. <coughs> This is where we're actually deciding to be continent or, or incontinent. Um, and then that eventually forms our, our character. Once you're virtuous, it's easy to do the right thing. Once you're vicious, it's actually easy to do the wrong thing. Um, so he says, <coughs> excuse me, we're going to distinguish between what he calls incontinent in a qualified sense and incontinent in an unqualified sense, um, the terms that he's using. So unqualified means sort of in general without adding anything to it. If you say that somebody is a good person and you don't say anything more, you're calling them good unqual unqualifiedly. If you say that person is uh, good for sports, you're really narrowing it in, right? <clears throat> you're not making any claims about them being good as a hook, <coughs> being good as a friend or anything like that. You're saying they're good in sports. It's the same thing with incontinence. So let's now actually use some of these, these examples. Um, <clears throat> you've had a little bit of time to think about times when you found yourself failing uh, morally, doing things that you thought weren't, weren't right. Um, who would like to, to uh, I won't actually just call out people, who would, who would like to volunteer uh, some example? And then we'll see if we can fit them into Aristotle's idea. Something small. Nobody killed anybody over the weekend, right? <laughs> That's a good one. Okay, so you you coerced your friend into uh, telling a secret. So this is an interesting one because so what you did, you knew wasn't the right thing to do, and the wrong thing for you to do was to make somebody else do the wrong thing. So this is a kind of complicated. So then, we have we have an example. Um, let's call that let's put it right here. Um, <clears throat> let's use your friend. So your friend told a secret, and you uh, pressured your friend. Um, what else? What are other things? That's a common one. Um, uh, we often call those, uh, you know, small lies or white lies or stuff like that, right? Total lie to get out of um, something. Okay. Um, notice that one actually includes the explanation of why why you did it. Right? Any anyone else? Very, very good. 
Nobody has any, any check marks against them. Nobody's going to judge you for, for any of this sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, I went home this weekend, and um, one of my friends, like I know, I saw her cheating on like, her boyfriend, and she's like, they're both kind of like my friends. Uh -huh. So, I, I mean, I didn't tell him, so I'm kind of like, wrong for not. <coughs> he's my friend. For Wait, so friends. she, she, what was she doing? She cheated on him. Oh, okay. So, not revealing uh, cheating. <coughs> yeah. Um, but you felt it was wrong not, not to, yeah. Uh, in high school, and maybe my first year here, gambling. Because mm. I always won. Because you won? Aristotle might say that's not, if, you, if you're guaranteed to win, that wouldn't be a bad thing. But let's say, um, uh, we'll call it gambling imprudently. Because you don't know that you're going to win, right? Yeah, I have a lot of them, I do. Do you have a system? Uh, I'm just really good with one, like, no topics of that in like sports. <coughs> ah. Yeah, I've got, a, I've got a friend, actually, uh, another uh, philosophy professor who counts cards because um, her dad is, is a professional gambler and uh, that's how they spent time together when she was a kid. And she's actually been barred from, from some casinos because if they catch you, you know, uh, they don't like that. It evens out the odds. Any, anything else? Anybody else has got? Well, let's, let's work with these. So. Um, this one we already have the, the explanation. Whole lie to get out of something. You, you, didn't, you didn't want to, you, there was some occasion you didn't want to go to. That's more avoiding pain than, than seeking pleasure, right? Or maybe you did it to avoid that something so you could go see pleasure. You could go, go do something more fun, like even just, you know, play a video game sometimes, right? Um, Pressuring a friend to tell a secret. Why do we like people to tell secrets? We, we enjoy it, right? We, we want to find out. That's why people buy gossip magazines and we go online to find out what this celebrity is doing or that one's doing. Um, even, you know, and curiosity doesn't have to be celebrity based. Uh, most of your professors who are researching something, they are curious about that and they get a certain pleasure out of it. Um, telling a secret. Um, well, your friend did it to get the pressure that you're bringing off of them, right? So again, avoiding some sort of pain rather than, or maybe pleasing you could be the, the, the reason. Um, not revealing cheating because you felt uncomfortable or... Because either way I mm. Okay. So, yeah. So you... you, you May have actually sort of made a calculation, well, I'll lose less this way than, than that way. Because once you tell somebody that somebody else is cheating on them, the whole weekend is, is going to be about that, right? Yeah. I mean, Maybe even longer than the weekend. Um, gambling imprudently, that would be a problem if, you know, um, you find yourself not, not able to control yourself, or um, you're, you think you shouldn't do it, but you, you wind up doing it anyway. What's that? 32 and 12. I don't know what 32 and 12 is. Wins and losses. Oh, well then it might be prudent. So maybe this wouldn't be an example. We want something that, where you knew it was wrong, but you, you did it anyway. So if we think about these, these are all pretty straightforward, pretty, you know, uh, minor stuff, potentially, I guess. I mean, all these could actually be very big things, depending on the context. But I don't think any of yours are. Why do we end up doing this sort of stuff? We experience a kind of weakness or moment of indecision or something else bringing us along. And for each one of these things, you could ask yourself, could you have told yourself, no, I'm going to do this. I'm, I'm going to follow through on this. And the answer is probably yes, right? And you can multiply these sort of instances all the time in our lives. Um, should I be more courteous to people? Should I uh, 
follow up with, with you know, friends that I haven't corresponded with for a while? Should I be more um, conscious about uh, how my fiance is doing and ask her how she's doing more often and those sorts of things? Sure. You know, we can all find instances like that. Um, why don't we do it? Well, there, there are other things going on. Uh, there's something else happening within ourselves. So that's where we need to look at what Aristotle actually says. <coughs> Aristotle thinks about this in a couple different ways. And this is where it gets really murky. And <coughs> his presentation is sort of all over the map. So I'm just going to lay it out for you schematically, and then we can look at the things bit by bit. Um, He talks about cases where we know what is right and wrong. So Aristotle says, he talks about this in terms of we have the general or universal principle, right? And what tells you that? Um, reason or your, your proper upbringing or, or habits or something along those lines. So you know what you ought to do. So what actually makes you do the other thing? Well, it could be what he calls an appetite. It could be anger. which he treats differently than the other appetites and emotions. It's kind of a curious thing for him. Well, you remember Plato did too, didn't we? Plato had thumos, so the spirited part of the soul, the part that we get angry with, <coughs> is different than just the rest of the appetites. And then he talks about, um, um, he uses the term opinion in this translation. These will often can, can work together. So, you can know what the right thing to do is, but you have a strong appetite to do the wrong thing. And what are the appetites that he talks about? Um, those, we're talking about um, incontinence unqualifiedly, it has to do with pleasure. What are the basic pleasures that Aristotle thinks are the strongest? We've talked about this before. What are the ones that the, the moderate or the temperate person has under control? Yeah. Food, drink, and sex. Food, drink, and sex, yeah. These are very basic. And these, you know, again, you look at any culture, look at any time, look at people anywhere you go, unless we radically change human nature, and these will be fundamental drivers. He also talks about wanting to avoid certain kinds of pains. So, so actually now I've sort of run out of room. Let me put, let me change this a little bit. I'll put other appetites. And then anger. Um, so, how does intemperance work in those sort of cases? You know that you shouldn't have the dessert. Um, you've all been at you know sort of fancy meals, right? Or you go home for, for vacation and it's going to be Thanksgiving and uh, Christmas is coming up as well. And what, what often happens to people weight wise over over uh, from Thanksgiving to New Year's? Gain weight. They gain weight. What? Now why does that happen? Eat a lot. Yeah, why, why do we eat a lot over that time? What's, what's different about that, that time of the year? What's that? It's holidays, you eat. It's holidays, yeah. And <coughs> at holidays, people have off so they can cook more. And very often you have traditions of, you know, we have to have this and that. Like in my family, at Christmas time, we have oyster soup. And we have Tootsie Eye, which is a French meat pie. And we have a bouche de Noël big log cake, but not everybody likes the log cake, so there's always other desserts, and it's, you know, nosh, nosh, nosh all day long, right? Same for, for Thanksgiving. And, you know, 
This is the way we show people hospitality, right? We offer them food and drink. Um, and, it, you know, if you want to maintain a diet or something like that, you would be telling yourself, I can't have all of this. Um, and you may actually feel yourself, um, you know, when you're reaching for that third dessert, saying, you know, this is actually unreasonable. I don't need three desserts. I didn't even need the second one. But the pleasure over over masters. Um, now, if that happens all the time, you're vicious. If you think that that's the right thing to do, you're vicious. But the the, the <clears throat> incontinent person, they know it's the wrong thing, but they find themselves unable to do it because the the, the pleasure takes over momentarily. Uh, and we'll look at how the reasoning process works with this in, in a moment. Um, sex is another great example too. In the culture that we currently inhabit, we have managed to remove most of the boundaries that were in place for, um, for Western culture for hundreds of years. Maybe you can say thousands of years. So if you get constantly placed into situations where you probably shouldn't, you know, get involved with, with this person or that person, but it's tempting, and there's nothing else, you know, other than your conscience or, you know, sort of a general sense of rationality saying, you shouldn't do this. It will probably be difficult to resist, right? Especially when you're constantly being bombarded with images about how, how much fun everybody else is having. You know, we're, we're in a society now where um, the pressures to be incontinent, to be, to be immoderate, are much higher than they were just a generation ago. I know it because you know, I was—I grew up 20 years uh, apart from, from you guys, and I can, I can look at how uh, things are for you and how things were for me. And it was stronger for our generation than it was for the generation before them, and, and vice versa. So it'd be very easy to be uh, incontinent when it comes to, to sex. This is also one that can get you in, in a lot more direct trouble too, right? quicker than food or drink. Um, avoiding pain. Um, people often, you know, they know that they should do this, they should they should put up with this pain, but they want to avoid it. And so they, they do. Um, so that's the case where the appetite overmasters us. Other appetites. What are other things that Aristotle says we we want, we desire, and they can lead us to be uncontrolled. Remember? Well, as well. Yeah. This is a really interesting one. There's a lot of ways to make a buck. And some of them are, as Aristotle says, honorable, and some of them are not so honorable. We talked about this when we looked at um, uh, the, the virtues and, and, and vices associated with how we use wealth. We talked about greedy people. Greedy people really like wealth, and they're convinced that that's what they want to, to have, wealth and, and possessions. Um, you can find yourself very easily in many situations where you know that you shouldn't take the money, or you shouldn't pursue this opportunity, uh, or you shouldn't make this deal, but it's very tempting to do so. And again, we live in a society where you're being urged to do that very often. And there's a lot of little traps out there um, set to do that. You, you can think, for example, let, let, actually let's think of a large scale trap and, and then a small scale trap. One that you definitely won't fall for, one that you, you might fall for. Um, they both have to do with the internet. <clears throat> you're all familiar with the uh, Nigerian banking scam emails. Um, there's like a lot of variations of these. How do they usually go? Those of you who recognize what I'm talking about. Uh, like one night, Jeremy, May, uh, my friend actually got an email. Yeah. And, you know, we're talking about it because uh, they're saying, oh, if you send us this amount of money, <coughs> we can give you, a, like, I don't know, like, I think it was like $1,000, we can give you $10,000 in the U.S. Yeah. Money back and... 
the the the, the oldest one is like ten thousand dollars of gold. That was it. Yeah, the oldest one is, is actually like you know I'm I'm this Nigerian minister. Um, my money is quite in the bank here. I need to, to put it in a U.S. bank. I'd like to use your account. And if you just give me your account number, I'll put you know several million dollars in there, and I'll give you a ten percent cut. And you give them the account number, and instead of money going in, money goes out, right? Uh, and not a lot of people fall for those anymore. But there's a lot of things like lotteries. You know, if you, somebody claims you won the, the Australian national lottery, uh, you didn't enter. Uh, there's probably a problem there. Uh, now you're not likely to fall for those sorts of things. What about all these little opportunities that exist? And I'm not actually saying that you shouldn't do any of these. I'm just saying you should you should be prudent about these. Uh, not let, not necessarily let your desire for wealth, which is understandable, overmaster reason. What about all these little opportunities to, you know, get a little price cut here, get a coupon here, that require you to get all sorts of information? If you, if you look at some of those deals, they're not really deals, are they? And you could think this out. You could actually be, you know, you, you have to click on stuff. You have to look at what the terms of the offer are. You could actually look at that, but you could, at least in that moment, um, or, you know, perhaps characteristically, uh, find yourself saying, oh, this, you know, I really want this deal. I really have to have this. Or think about the grocery store as well. Um, sometimes it's hard to resist two for one offers, isn't it? Even though you don't actually need two of them. I went to Sam's Club the, the, the other day, and it was two for one uh, packs of tortillas, you know, like the, the big hundred corn tortillas. And we were making something with, with tortillas, and I only took one, and I got to the front register, and she, she wouldn't ring it up for me because I didn't have, you know, two. They, could, they literally couldn't ring it up as two for one. This is a computer glitch. But it, it shows you, you know, this, this sort of mentality. Um, we are very often incontinent when it comes to wealth. If you're walking by the, the, the gas station um, counter and you find yourself buying a lighter because the lighter, you know, attracted you, that, that's probably more just, just pleasure than it has to do with your use of wealth. Um, what we call impulse buying, right? Impulse buying is very often an example of incontinence. If you're doing it all the time and you think that's the right thing to do, then that would actually be vicious. Because it's not a, a good thing to do. It's a very small vice. But um, if you're doing it and then afterwards you regret it, then you're probably incontinent. Um, well, so wealth. You talk about gain. Gain is pretty much the same thing as wealth. Um, what are other things that we tend to get led astray by? Good things. Even honorable things, decent things, are not always the right thing for us at the time. Anyone remember? Think back to when we talked about the candidates for happiness. You remember what some of the other candidates besides virtue or wealth or pleasure? What else do we need? Seek out. Yeah. Honor and respect. Yeah, very good. Believe it or not, you know, you can get caught in situations where seeking honor is actually the wrong thing to do. It, it all depends on how you conceive of honor or respect or, or those sorts of things. Concepts, but there can be situations where being honorable might interfere with, say, being just or being temperate or even being kind to another person. Um, and you know, you, you can be intemperate with respect to to that because we do seek that. And there are there are some people who are more ambitious with respect to, to honor. That's more of a problem area for them than, than others. Um, anything else that we could add in, in, in here that's not just pleasures or things like that? Aristotle says one other thing, and this, this is one you can probably relate to. 
victory. Winning. How many of you have been in an argument and you said something in the argument, maybe a cheap shot, you know, a dig at somebody, and you won the argument as a result, um, but you knew it wasn't the right thing to do at the time? Any of you ever done that? Well, Aristotle calls people like that philonikos. Um, they, they, they like, they are attracted to, they have as a desire winning. Not Charlie Sheen kind of winning, uh, which is very ambiguous. The losing ends up being winning, right? But actually winning. Um, do you know how this manifests for me? We've talked about driving before. Uh, a few of you may relate to this. I like passing people. How many of you like, like passing people? Am I the only one? A few of you? I actually get a charge out of it. Um, and uh, when I realized that, I, you know, it took a long time before I actually realized that this was the case for me. I just sort of felt it for a while and would act on it. It's not always the best thing. You know, you get yourself into lots of situations each day where you can try to get that little extra move around the person, and often it doesn't even work because around here because you have so many stoplights, right? So you, you pass the person and then you're stuck at the same stoplight. You didn't actually gain anything. Um, that's a type of, of um, being motivated by the desire to, to win. And if, if you're doing it in risky circumstances, again, you're probably in contact. Then you probably want to take a look at that so that you don't get yourself to the point where you justify it to yourself so many times that you actually become vicious. Um, you all know people who are vicious with respect to winning, I think, as, as, as a, a uh, motivational factor, right? That's all they seem to care about. When you, when you approach them about that, they say, you only think that because you're a loser? You're not a winner like me? That would be a sign of being vicious. Um, again, it's, it's very easy to, to make that, that transition. Let's move on to anger. Anger is really interesting because Aristotle treats that differently than he does all these other emotions. He's even got a section where he talks about why uh, losing your temper um, and acting on that is not as bad as following any of these things. Um, probably not really good advice to give anybody who has an anger problem because now you just told them that what they're doing is more or less okay. Right? Um, but he, so he says, incontinence in respect of anger is less disgraceful than that in respect of the appetites. Anger seems to listen to argument to some extent, but to mishear it. And here he's got a great simile. As hasty servants who run out before they've heard the whole of what one says, uh, or um, as dogs bark if there's but a knock at the door before looking to see who it is. So anger is kind of indiscriminate. You guys all have experienced this. When you get angry, what happens to you? How, how do you begin to uh, approach the world differently? On impulse rather than rationality. There's that. That's that's very broad, though. <coughs> what, what is it like for you? Not, none of you literally see red, where you, you know your whole world turns red. There are some people that that happens to. That's a that's a biological problem. Um, what happens psychologically to you? You get kind of tunnel vision. So suddenly things that weren't so important assume great importance. You have to insist on this point. They have to understand this before we can proceed any further. Somebody have to over here. Yeah. Depending on what it is, temporary, you're angry at, you feel temporary hate. Yeah, you, you have this, this feeling of, of uh, wishing the other person ill. And, and, you know, Aristotle doesn't say this, <clears throat> but other moral philosophers say this, that anger, if it goes on long enough, will eventually become hate. Um, anger kind of takes us away. It sets us on a trajectory. And it becomes very difficult to get out of. As a matter of fact, some of the people who studied anger have realized things like, if you want to get yourself calmed down, you need to go off and do something else. <clears throat> and if you do it for about 10, 20 minutes, and you do it consistently, you will actually find yourself getting calmer. If, however, you allow yourself to think about 
the thing that you're angry about, it will not help you. You'll be just as angry. So if you're thinking about that person and what a jerk they were, and who are they to say that sort of thing, you will continue to stay angry. And the angry person very often tends to do that because, you know, being in the right about these sorts of things. Anger is about being in the right. You get angry when you feel that somebody has wronged you and that they didn't have any good reason to do that. And you feel yourself to be in the right to want some sort of, you know, revenge. Um, so like he says, you know, it's, it's like reason, except it only listens to half the story. Then once you start listening to only half the story, it continues to only listen to half the story. Um, so, you know, the angry person, while they're acting, they, there could be two cases. They could be acting and they're, they're sort of in control, uh, they're, they're being controlled by anger. Anger is in control of them. And then afterwards, they realize what they did and they realize it was wrong. I should have, you know, sworn at that person. Uh, I shouldn't have used foul language with, with them. Um, but I was angry at the time. They're, you know, the angry at the time doesn't excuse it. But it does tell why that, that actually occurred. Um, there can be cases where you're angry and as you're doing things while you're angry, you, you know that they're wrong to do, but you still find yourself sort of gripped by the anger and, and doing them nonetheless. Um, what else? He says, argument or imagination informs us that we've been insulted or slighted. Anger, reasoning, as it were, that anything like this must be fought against boils up straight away. Where appetite, if argument or perception says an object is pleasant, springs up to, to the enjoyment of it. So anger obeys the argument in a sense, but appetite actually doesn't. What he means by the argument is the argument about what we ought to do that's good. Um, and then he says, uh, we pardon people more easily for following natural desires. And here's something that he says is very interesting. Anger is one of our most natural desires. Anger is one of our most natural emotions. Um, Aristotle says. We could contest that. Maybe that, maybe um, that's not what we actually think. Go ahead. Well, like, why would you say that it's a really a desire, though? I mean, I don't say it's a natural emotion, but yes, I mean that's a good question. Desire anger is kind of. This is sort of a digression, um, but this is actually something I'm, I'm myself very interested in. Um, Aristotle defines a lot of the emotions in terms of desires. Some of them are just responses, like joy or sadness are just responses. Anger involves, anger is very complicated, and Aristotle is good for getting at this. Anger involves um, a form of pain, pain of being wrong or harmed or something like that. It also involves actually a, a, an anticipation of pleasure in, in, in getting what it wants. What it wants is what he calls um, apparent or public retribution or punishment, or however you want to translate this particular term. Sometimes you could say revenge, uh, against the person who the angry person feels wrong them. So anger actually is, it, ang anger does involve a desire, a desire for um, retribution. That's why we often do get calm when we see the other person get hurt. It doesn't always even have to be us doing the hurting. It could be you're angry at president, because the president did something that you can't stand, and then you see somebody else, you know, haranguing him, and you're, ah, okay, now I feel okay. Um, it doesn't have to be you necessarily, but there has to be something that sort of tips the balance, that lights the scales again. That's what the angry person wants. So it does involve desire. Um, now, whether, whether we are, as human beings, uh, more naturally inclined to anger than other things? I don't know. I think that's very debatable. Um, pleasure exerts you know, incredible attractions on us. And, and these other things, you know, wealth, we do desire wealth. Anybody here who doesn't want any, any wealth? You know, as, you, as you're, you know, some of you are putting yourself in, in, in debt to go to school? Probably not, right? All of you, I think, want, honor, and respect. I don't know how motivated you are by winning. I'm guessing probably most of you are, right? Probably fairly ambitious in that respect. Um, so, 
Anger is more natural. Um, he also says those who are more given to plotting against others are more criminal. A passionate man is not given to plotting, nor is anger itself. It is open. One of the good things, one of the few good things about anger is that it lays stuff out on the table. You get somebody angry, and you do, in fact, find out a lot of things about what they actually do and they do think. Um, some of it's imagined, some of it's actually real. So Aristotle says it's actually not as bad to be incontinent with respect to anger as it is with respect to these things. I think in our society, we treat it differently, don't we? If you are incontinent with anger, where do they send you? If you do something wrong. Jail or anger management? Yeah, if you do, they may be sent you to, to, to jail or prison. But yeah, they, they, the courts can actually mandate anger management classes. <coughs> where you actually will hear a lot of stuff like what Aristotle is talking about and what Epictetus, who we're going to look at later, will talk about. He also talks about one other thing that's, that's kind of interesting. How acting in anger is not necessarily the same thing <coughs> as being vicious. He says, no one commits wanton outrage. Wanton outrage is what he calls cruel. It <clears throat> means to be cruel to another person with a feeling of pain. When people are cruel to other people, why do they do it? Because they get a kick out of it. They enjoy it. They, they uh, feel a good feeling hurting somebody else. Is that the case for the, the angry person who just loses control of their temper? <coughs> no. No. They, they feel pain when they, when they feel angry. Um, so, Aristotle thinks that, now if you do that often enough though, like with any of the other types of incontinence, if you allow yourself to lose your temper over and over and over again, remember there was a virtue and a vice associated with anger, right? Good temper, and there are all those different types of going wrong for um, bad temper. So if you do this often enough, then you will reach the point where you start telling yourself things like, you're always justified when you're feeling angry. Then you will feel more and more of that thrill. And some people actually become addicted to anger. They need to get angry all the time. You may know a few people like that. Um, so we have a few minutes left. Let's look at the, how the reasoning process actually works. So let's use just anger and the other advocates. What's going on over here, in one part of your, your mind and your psyche, is you have a general principle and it's telling you, you should do this. So how do you end up doing the appetite? The appetite says, um, you should, or people should, pursue pleasant things. The, the reasoning process. There's sort of two reasoning processes going on in your head at the same time. You know, appetite says you should pursue pleasant things. It's saying that all the time. You should pursue pleasant things. You should pursue pleasant things. And if it's a particular appetite, it's saying you should eat, you know, tasty food. You should eat tasty food. And this is going on in the back of your, your mind, you can think about it, or say in your body, constantly. Right? And this is part of what it is to be a human being. It's also part of what it is to be, be an animal, because animals all go around looking for nice things to eat too, right? Um, and you can do this with sense, or touch, or hearing, or anything like that. Once you've been exposed to something pleasant, you want that pleasant thing again. You know, you hear a kind of music that you like, um, you have a sort of appetite in it, sometimes it's stronger, sometimes it's weaker, but it's like a constant din, you should go do this, you should go do this you actually see something that's pleasant. You know it's pleasant. You've had it before. Let's take the dessert, for example. Right? Anybody here who doesn't like chocolate? There are a few people who don't like chocolate, not in, not in this class. So if I were to like, you know, take a really nice, um, well, we could use a chocolate bar or maybe like a brownie or something like that, and I were to put it right here, uh, those of you who, you know, wouldn't have your sight blocked by other students, Right? You know, you're all filing out of the room. You would be tempted to take that chocolate. 
None of you would, right? If, if I only had one and I put it right here, none of you would take it because all of you are, you know, pretty well-behaved, uh, well-brought-up individuals who have some degree of self-control. Um, but what if it was a classroom and somebody just left a chocolate there? Or like, let's say a whole bunch of chocolate bars, like a box, somebody is out there you know, doing their selling thing. And, you know, it's the last class of the day. Nobody's claimed it yet. It'd be tempting to take one of those. Chocolate is tasty, right? The appetite would be telling you, take a chocolate. Nobody's going to miss it. It's sort of like, you know, the devil and the angel on your shoulders. The appetite is the devil, right? Um, meanwhile, you still have something going on in the back of your head. This is why you're not vicious, saying, you shouldn't take that. Why shouldn't you take it? Because it's not yours. You shouldn't take things that are not yours. That's carrying out practical reasoning, too. So you have two different courses of practical reasoning. What tips the scales? Appetite is strong. You feel appetite. So you do it. Um, with anger, it's a little bit different. Like, like Aristotle said, anger, here's the reasoning. Um, when he talked about being, I think, insulted, I, right, everyone, <clears throat> should take revenge. So with, with anger, it's a little bit different. Um, you have this, this, again, part of your human nature. When insulted, everyone should take revenge. It's sort of a principle underlying how anger works. Um, I mean, if you don't take any revenge or feel any bad feelings when you're insulted, Aristotle actually says there's something wrong with you. Um, but it's a question of you know, how we do it. Right people, right time, all that sort of stuff. So and so insulted me. Where do we often go wrong? With anger, typically it's this. Did they actually insult you? How many times do we take offense at people where no offense was actually intended? Quite often, right? Um, driving is a great example of that. You know, the person who's driving, for me, it's the people driving so in front of me when I can't pass them. Thankfully, I don't feel very angry anymore, but you know, I still feel some degree of anger. And I feel like they're wronging me by being in my way. They're, they're taking up the public road space that belongs to all of us. By God, why don't they get out of our way so people who actually have somewhere to get to can get by them and get to where they need to go? That, that's the, does this sound familiar? You ever feel something like this? Uh, well, that's, that's a case where anger is suggesting a course of action, you know, and then when you go around them, what are you tempted to do once you're actually able to pass them? What's that? Speed up. Yeah, you might speed up and we'll show you, you know, um, or you flip them off, or people do all sorts of things. They, they pass them and then they cut them off and then they go real slow. I'm going to show you what it's like to be stuck. Behind somebody's work as well. Well, what does reason say about that? Is that smart? Is that a good thing to do? You're driving a you know a one ton piece of metal around um, that's only controlled by this you know this this the steering wheel. Is it smart to <clears throat> to do those sorts of things? No, it's 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 a bad idea. So what re or what anger is suggesting um, goes against what reason is just telling you. And if you're going to follow anger in that case, you're incontinent. Anger is blinding you, as we say. And then afterwards, you know, you, you may feel foolish. If you don't feel bad about it afterwards, that's probably a sign that you're becoming vicious with respect to anger. And pretty soon you're going to find yourself doing all sorts of things as an angry person and saying that it's okay. Um, so those are the reasoning processes taking place. A lot less murky than what Aristotle himself is saying you know, about the, you know, when he's talking about 
uh, sweet things must be tasted, and here's the particular, and here's the universal. This is, this is what he's talking about there. Yeah. The thing with like wanting a chocolate bar, it's easy to kind of figure it out because you only have one answer. Either you take it or you don't. With dealing you can with take half of it. Take half of it, but you still have to either take it or not. Yeah. You know, with anger, there's so many ways they handle even one issue, such as passing somebody or not passing somebody. Oh. It's just a fraction of it. I mean, you can, you know, be if you can. <coughs> You know, flash your lights at flash them, your you lights. tailgate them. You know. you know, there's so many ways that to well, be either, you know, within like, a, it's not really wrong, but, you know, it can be. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll grant you that in those cases that we picked out, there are a lot of alternatives for the driving one. There's only a, a, a one range of alternatives for the candy bar. But we could think of other cases where um, appetite is involved, where there could be a whole range of, possibilities. Um, like, you know, for instance, uh, you're out at the bar, and you're actually in a, in a relationship, <clears throat> but, you know, it's not really that um, solid yet, and uh, you're not quite sure whether you're monogamous or not, um, but you suspect that you are, uh, and there's somebody attractive at the end of the bar that you could, you, could, um, you know, get involved with. And people will go through all sorts of mental gyrations about this. Well, you know, if I just go make out with them in the car, that's not the same thing as cheating. There's this line that could be drawn, and this line, and this line. I'm not sure if I'm, I mean, you could actually, here's, here's one thing. You could actually call the person who you're involved with up and say, are we exclusive? Because uh, I've got kind of a, a situation to resolve here, through practical reasoning. I don't want to say that, right? But um, that's an alternative, one that won't be taken, probably. Um, this whole range of other things, um, you know, then there could be the range of follow what reason dictates in this, in this situation, which is don't mess around. But do you do that by, you know, turning your chair and not allowing yourself to be distracted by that person? Do you go up to them and have a conversation with them just to make sure that you can, like, you know, get yourself through it? There's a lot of possibilities, right? So, so there, my point is, it's the situation that would tell us how many possibilities for action there would be. It's not necessarily just anger has more and, and appetite has, has less. Um, wealth, there could be like all sorts of possibilities. Uh, I want to talk very quickly about brutishness. So, Aristotle says um, there can be cases where a person just can't choose where we wouldn't hold them responsible. And he doesn't totally get the person off the hook. He says that, that uh, brutishness or brutality is actually more, more terrifying, more uh, scary, more appalling than vice. With vice, the person could do otherwise, but they've gotten themselves in this sort of situation with respect to their character where they're not going to do otherwise. Um, let's use, for example, um, murderers, or, or you know, um, even worse, uh, murder, murder rapists, right? Um, some of them I used to teach, and some of them, like one guy, I could really, you know, I would really have a lot of sympathy for this guy. He wasn't a rapist; he was, he was a murderer. Um, another man, when he was 20 years old, raped and killed his wife, and he knew that this guy probably was not going to get caught and was not going to get sentence, he knew who did it, so he went and killed him himself, and because he, because there was a, an interval, they decided to give him a murder one. And so he, he did 20 years, a uh, 50 year sentence, um, in Indiana you get time cuts for various things. Um, that guy, I could really, if I was placed in that situation, I would have a very hard time not doing something similar to what he did. I think a lot of us could, could relate to that. That's not at all, that's, that's incontinence with respect to anger, more or less. He wasn't a vicious guy. Then there's people who are vicious. Um, there are, you know, there were guys in there who had killed witnesses. Um, who, you know, I used to teach a lot of former gang members. And some of them were people who liked to kill people. You know, um, and 
And so you want to keep those, those sort of people in prison as long as you can, unless they're, they're going to change. That would be vicious. But they could still recognize that at least society thought that was wrong, and uh, they better not do it, you know, they better not follow their appetites that much. Then there's people who, you know, like hurting and killing people, and there's nothing you can reason with. There's no better part. And those are the people who are really scary, really dangerous. Um, not every case is, is that extreme. He talks about a lot of other cases like that. And what might we put under that, that we think about a lot in our society? The person who is um, completely addicted to some sort of, uh, say, a hard drug, like heroin, or uh, methamphetamines, or um, crack. Um, the sort of things that really lay you out. You know, if you're addicted to tobacco, you can stop yourself from smoking, can't you? You can get the patch, you can make choices. You are addicted, and it really hurts when you have to quit smoking. Uh, I know. <laughs> it's a strong craving. But if you're addicted to heroin, that's very different, isn't it? I mean, you can get methadone when somebody forces you into the clinic and makes you do it. It's very tough to keep that, that happen. And you will do all sorts of things in order to make the money that's required in order to get the heroin to, to do that. Um, at a certain point, alcoholism does that. People drink long enough, eventually it burns out large portions of their brain. And they just can't function. With, you know, they, they can function when they've got the alcohol, and otherwise they're, they're just sort of a hollow shell. Um, that would be a case of what he's calling brutishness. In that case, it doesn't make any sense to talk about voluntary and involuntary anymore. But this is Aristotle's point. I'm not saying that you necessarily have to have this position. There's something no longer human about that. They've sort of descended to the level of pure animality. What's really interesting in here, in this section, when I, when I was reading it through uh, this time, and I hadn't caught this before, Aristotle actually talks about the effects of sex abuse. He, he's got a line in there where he's talking about different reasons why somebody might end up having some compulsion within them that they simply cannot avoid meeting. And it could be something that would be, you know, uh, deviant. It's a pleasure that most people don't take pleasure in, but this person does. And he talks about those, um, let's see if I can find the actual line. He talks about, yeah, um, he says, Others, uh, other brutish states arise as a result of disease, or in some case madness. Some of them are arising from custom. If you're, if you're in a, a situation where everybody around you is screwed up, you're probably going to end up being screwed up as well. If you grew up in a society where it's common to um, a, you know, uh, throw children in to fight dogs or something like that, you're probably going to have a very low opinion of, of human life. Uh, but then he says, um, these arise in some by nature and in others, as in those who have been the victims of lust from childhood, by habit. Uh, and uh, this is what I'm going to leave you with. My, my mentor, who was actually not just a, a uh, philosophy professor, he was also a, a, um, a practicing um, counselor, clinician who works with abused children. In class one day, we were discussing a different philosopher. He said that what's really bad about um, child, uh, childhood sexual abuse is that it radically rearranges, in a bad way, the child's understanding of what the good is. It doesn't just do it intellectually. It does it in terms of their, their habits and character. In cases like that, Aristotle would say, perhaps we can't actually hold that person accountable the way we would uh, other people. We can't hold them to the same amount of responsibility. Doesn't mean that we can't punish them for Aristotle. Doesn't mean that we can't say what they're doing is wrong. But it means that their structure and motivation would be, would be very different. Much more like that of the yeah, and, and in the case of certain types of sexual abuse, that does seem to be the case. So I'll leave you on that, that unhappy note, and uh, I'll see you on uh, Thursday.